Good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. Uh, I'm Andrew Schwartz. I'm our Senior Vice President for External Relations, and I have the pleasure of working um, with these wonderful colleagues here who have agreed to um, get up at the crack of dawn, and, and everybody, thank you all for coming so early, too. We, want, we knew today was a busy day, and there's a lot of um, other briefings going on uh, at the White House and so forth, and so we wanted to um, get this done early. We will have a transcript later today, which uh, either Ryan or I will mail it out, and the only reason it won't be me is because I was just telling Howard and some others I'm embroiled in um, third grade, the politics of third grade basketball, um, and I also have to coach my fifth grade bas uh, baseball team today, so these are important matters of national security that I'm sure all of you came here to hear about. But we will be sending out um, um, a transcript later today, um, and we'll also have video um, of this up on the website uh, within the, a few hours after the event. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our Middle East <coughs> Program Director, John Alterman. Many of you know John. Um, he's um, one of our senior, senior people here at CSIS and uh, has a few things to say about what's going to be happening at the uh, UN next week. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to John. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's good to see you all. Uh, because I know there's a lot of interest in this, I, I took the effort and I found a copy of Susan Rice's diary uh, from last night. And, and start, the entry starts with, <laughs> it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief, the epic of incredulity, the season of light, the season of darkness, the spring of hope, the winter of despair. That's what this week is going to be like. There's good news that's coming out of the UN. The good news is the Libya stuff is actually going pretty well. Right? The Libya stuff, if you're the Obama administration, where do you want Libya to go? You want Libya to go precisely where it has been going. There has been no mass casualties in Libya, no huge retribution. The international community is stepping up. There will be a new resolution today in the Security Council that will authorize Ian Martin to go in with a team to work. It's not the United States making Libya into a model of what it wants to be. It's the U.S. and the international community assisting Libya, not with the U.S. responsibility, but with broad international support. And the U.S. has played a facilitating role. We have a huge number of bilateral issues, very important issues, not just having to do with governance, but having to do with weapons and decommissioning of weapons, finding the weapons that have disappeared. It's not that we don't have issues in Libya. But the international community is acting precisely the way the United States would like the international community to act. The administration is playing the role it would like to play. And events on the ground are unfolding very much the way the United States would like them to unfold. That's not to say Libya is going to be a success. It's much too early. We have a lot of bumps in the road ahead of us. But where we are with the UN right now, I think the feeling is this is moving in place. This is what the UN is supposed to do. That's the good stuff. That's the best of times. The worst of times is I can't figure out any way anybody comes out ahead on this Palestine vote. I see it hurting everybody's interests. The Israelis have thrown down the gauntlet and said this is a vital threat to the state of Israel. Raising the stakes on a vote, it will surely lose. The United States is, finds itself in an impossible position, says it will veto the resolution of the Security Council, will end up once again on the wrong end of a lopsided vote in the General Assembly, surely leading to all sorts of complaints the administration has no credibility in the international stage. The Europeans, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to Heather on this, I think the Europeans have a miserable choice ahead of them because on the one hand, they have been vociferously articulating their desire for a Palestinian state, they don't want to be on the wrong side of the United States. They don't want to alienate the Israelis. There is no good way for this to turn out for Europe and for the Palestinians. Does this really do anything for the Palestinians? I would argue it does nothing for the Palestinians. It raises expectations in the Palestinian community for what follows. It does nothing practical that advances Palestinian interests. It antagonizes the Israelis. It makes them feel more isolated. It has them hunkered down more. And it antagonizes Congress, which may cut U.S. funding for the Palestinian Authority. I don't see any way anybody does an iota better 
as a consequence of this, but everybody's in a position where it's very hard to step down. And the, the administration's approach has been to try to subvert this with diplomatic negotiations. We'll, we'll do enough of a push toward diplomacy that it'll make everybody happy. Well, first, I don't think diplomacy is going to be enough to dissuade people. Second, I don't think the missing link here is diplomacy. I think the missing link is politics. The missing link is that there is no support on the Israeli side for making far-reaching concessions to the Palestinians because they don't think it'll get them peace. There is no support on the Palestinian side for making far-reaching concessions to the Israelis because they don't think it'll get them peace. And until you begin to alter those politics, it's very hard to make the diplomacy work. Is it possible to get a broader resolution that says some things that may make a more constructive environment in the future? <coughs> it's possible. But the real danger, and I think the likelihood, um, is that where we will go is toward greater feelings of isolation, greater feelings of, um, of vulnerability, that this won't be constructive for anybody. Um, the, the sort of U.S.-Israeli angle of this, which I think agonizes the Obama administration uh, deeply and, and agonizes the government of Israel, uh, is something that we've talked about in this book that we're rolling out at 9.30 this morning about the, the future of the U.S.-Israeli relationship. So if you have some downtime in your briefings today, I think it's worth, it's worth a look. It describes the fact that this is not the old U.S.-Israeli relationship and it won't be the U.S.-Israeli relationship going forward. I think it is, is well worth uh, the time it will take you to read it, and I commend it to you. And with that, I turn over. And we, we do have copies of uh, our new report, uh, Crossroads, the, uh, about the U.S.-Israeli relationship by Hi, I'm Malka, which uh, Ryan has at the back of the room, so we'll make sure you guys get copies if you need them. Do you want to hear this? Sure. And uh, my colleague, Mark Quarterman, who is the director of our C3 program, Conflict Cooperation, Conflict Crisis, Crisis Conflict and Cooperation. Uh, Mark's, of course, former UN official. Um, we're very grateful to have him here this morning. Mark. Uh, thank, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, after, after that lead-in um, from, uh, from John, uh, uh, you can't do much better than Tale of Two Cities. But before I get to the really <laughs> turgid good. stuff about General Assembly votes, Security Council resolutions, and I do plan to say a few words about that, I, I, I just want to kind of, in a more general way, talk about what next week means in a general sense. Um, uh, the general debate of the General Assembly really is the annual convention of heads and states, heads of state and governments. You know, they they come together kind of like in any industry, um, as in any annual convention. Uh, less interesting things often happen in the convention meeting rooms, and more interesting things happen on the margins. Uh, the bilateral meetings the president's going to have, the small group meetings. Um, if you look at it this way then the speech has become a lot less important and the interactions on, on issues that they're just going to take advantage of being together uh, become a lot more important. Um, and you can imagine what that, that shadow agenda is uh, that bleeds a little bit into the official agenda. Um, the, the vote on, on Palestinian recognition, uh, the uh, uh, updating each other on the Arab Spring and activities uh, regarding that, uh, Libya, um, uh, Syria, uh, the economic crisis in the in the in the European Union will will be will be key issues. Um, as regards the Palestinians, <clears throat> the, the 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 recent news reports are saying that they're first going to opt for um, a full membership, which 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 means that they have to go through the Security Council, um, and then uh, likely there, there would be a likely fallback, as John said, to the General Assembly. Um, and it's extremely likely, of course, that the United States will veto. Although there, 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 there is a, an, another option of, of sending it to uh, um, uh, a committee of the whole of the Security Council to review the Palestinians' request. Um, that would kick it down the, kick the can down the road a bit. It, it, it wouldn't necessarily be that useful a delaying tactic, but it is a delaying tactic. Um, uh, eventually, it, pardon me? Well, no, not, 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 to, not, not to the new General Assembly, because the Security Council meets on a rolling basis, so a couple of months, maybe a month or so. Uh, uh, th th this wouldn't be kicking it to the next year. 
Um, but, but ultimately, it probably would come up for a vote in the Security Council because there would be the support to bring it up for a vote, and, uh, um, and inevitably, the U.S. would veto. Um, just a footnote here. Um, the, the Soviet Union set all sorts of records that will never be broken, kind of Joe DiMaggio's sorts of records for vetoes in the Security Council. But since about the early 1980s, the U.S. has been the most active member of the, by, by far actually, the most active member of the Security Council in exercising its veto on the Security Council. And almost every one of those vetoes was on uh, an Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, and it often found itself vetoing uh, to override votes even by its allies in favor of a resolution by the U.S. and, the U and, and by the U.K. and France, among others. Um, so uh, uh, so that, that appears to be the Palestinians' first step, and they're going for, 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 the, for the full membership. The second step then would be to go to the General Assembly for an upgrade um, of their membership. Right now, they're permanent observers, and they would be looking for non-member state status. Now, people talk about that as Vatican status, which is and it, and it, it's the status that the Vatican holds now. But Switzerland held uh, that status for a number of years when it wasn't sure it, it wanted to join the United Nations. Um, and, uh, and early in their, in their uh, respective existences, South Korea and West Germany held that status, too. Um, uh, so so th this, this would, the Palestinians believe, uh, put them in a position to be able then to um, accede to a number of international treaties, um, the International Criminal Court, um, join any range of, of, of much less uh, glamorous international bodies, and and would 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 raise their 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 status in general around the world. Now, w we we should also know that the PLO for many years has has had um, uh, diplomatic status around the world in a number of countries. I think over a hundred um, have uh, 130 have recognized the PLO and and have. Um, uh, as, as, as the representatives of the Palestinian people, and there are PLO um, uh, diplomats uh, in, ofi in official missions um, in 130 countries. Um, it, it, we need to think about that when we think about, about, about the vote. Um, there's overwhelming support um, among the member states of the United Nations for Palestinian statehood. Um, and, uh, and as Jonathan correctly pointed out, the real question in the General Assembly vote is not um, whether uh, there would be support for this, but rather wh where would key U.S. allies end up on this vote? Where would, where would uh, European Union members, uh, among others? To put the vote in, uh, a vote like this in some context, too. I've, I've, I've had a few questions from reporters over recent days saying, well, if the U.S. loses a vote like this in the General Assembly, would this be an example of a diminishment of President Obama's uh, power? Well, there are about a dozen votes on, on the Palestinian issue that come up every year in the General Assembly. The vote count ranges from 116 to 5 to maybe 8 abstentions to 120 to 3 to 4 abstentions or whatever. Um, and the U.S. is almost always on the no side. Um, and the, the, these votes, the, the, the U.S. voting pattern has, and the, and the pattern in the General Assembly has been locked into place for, for, for decades. So. So uh, an overwhelming loss on this vote would be very much, for the U.S., would be very much along the lines of the half dozen or so votes. I mean, w one that was just up this year was a resolution um, by the General Assembly urging the, uh, uh, the Israelis to compensate the Lebanese for oil slicks um, on Lebanese shores from, uh, 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 from Israeli military actions. And if you bear with me for a second, I'll let you know what that vote was. Um, the U.S. voted against it, and it was um, uh, 163 uh, in favor, eight no, five abstaining, and the U.S. voted. Um, uh, the U.S. voted no. Uh, th this, the, the if 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 it were to go to the General Assembly, if there were to be a vote on uh, 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 th that vote, um, it was uh, urging Israel to compensate Lebanon for oil slicks uh, caused by Israeli military action. Um, there, are other, there are other votes on uh, uh, condemning uh, Israeli settlement policy, uh, um, human rights abuses in, uh, in, in the occupied Palestinian territory, among other things. And the, the vote count is, is very similar. Um, and there are probably, there are close to a dozen or so votes every year 
um, uh, on, on a variety of issues regarding Palestinians, whether it's um, in, the general in, the, in the General Assembly. In other bodies, there are more. Yes, exactly. Wh whether it's supporting the existence of a division for Palestinian rights in the Department of Political Affairs, in the UN Secretariat, or other things. And the, the, the vote counts, as I say, range from a, um, uh, you know, a, 116 to 7 to a number of abstentions. So the question really will be um, where will uh, Europe, U.S. European allies end up on this issue. How overwhelming will the vote be? And then ultimately, you know, get, getting away from the narrow U.N. politics, how useful will this be or how damaging will this be, as John said, uh, for um, uh, the range of players, the U.S., the Israelis, the Palestinians, the Europeans, and others. Um, John pretty much covered uh, Libya. Um, it is a positive story, and it's, and it's very much um, uh, the UN, as, as John said, doing what the UN does. Uh, uh, this is a post-conflict issue. Um, the proposal, uh, based on a, a initially a letter from uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to the President of the, of the Security Council that's since been translated into a, a resolution for the Security Council would provide for an assistant mission, assistance mission to be headed by actually my old boss, Ian Martin. He was my boss in East Timor where he over uh, saw the, uh, uh, the, uh, the referendum vote for East Timor's independence, um, but where Ian would uh, uh, lead a mission that would um, assist uh, Libya in a, in a range of post-conflict issues. Uh, it could, well, you know, could be with uh, 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 security sector reform, uh, financial sector reform, among other things, as well as uh, helping to coordinate um, uh, uh, international donors in general. Um, this is very much a comfort zone for the, for the UN. The UN has been in the lead on this. Um, I wrote something a while back way at the beginning when Resolution 1970 was adopted on, uh, on sanctions that uh, the UN acted with extraordinary speed for the Security Council, for any UN body, and, uh, um, and fulfilled what at least I thought was a multilateral moment. Uh, um, uh, potential crimes against humanity, or at least a humanitarian disaster occurring in Libya, and acting um, first with a, with a resolution on sanctions and then with a resolution authorizing military action to head that off. Uh, the Security Council did what it needed to, to do. The interesting shift in power question, and I'll stop after this, this is, a, this is a broader question, not just for this general debate, is not whether, as I said, what, what happens in the General Assembly on the Palestinians, but rather the, the number of states that abstained on Resolution 1973 that authorized military action and which states they were emerging powers lined up against the military action. China, of course, abstained, Russia abstained, but India and Brazil as well, um, uh, Germany uh, for its own reasons. But this, this is a very interesting question that I think we'll see more of in the future, in part because we have a, a surprisingly, I suppose you could say, powerful Security Council now with, with four and maybe four and a half members of the Council who have um, desires to be permanent and, and reasonable claims to be permanent members of the council. You have Brazil, India, um, South Africa, uh, um, uh, I'm blanking on one, uh, Brazil, India, South Africa. You've also got Nigeria on the council, which in the, uh, uh, in the past might have been a legitimate contender. Oh, in Germany, of course. Um, and, uh, and it's really, it's, it's thank you, yeah. and it's, um, uh, it's extraordinary to have that degree of regional power on the Security Council at the same time. And I think, therefore, it's very interesting to look back at their votes on the Libya issue and uh, the blocking of, the, of action on Syria um, in that context. And with that, I will turn over to Andrew to turn over to Heather. Thank you. Colleague Heather Conley, who's our Europe Program Director, many of you know, and uh, Heather. Thank you very much. John, when you started your, your quote, I actually thought you were talking about Europe. Uh, it is the best of times, certainly, for President Sarkozy and Prime Minister Cameron yesterday in their triumphant visit to Benghazi and Tripoli. And I, John, I, I think the Europeans would agree, certainly with your assessment that Libya, with a sigh of relief, has turned out well. I think they would slightly alter it in part because of strong European leadership. Uh, whether that was at the Security Council table or, or at NATO uh, or in providing 
the military and security uh, efforts to lead uh, to what we see today as victory. So indeed, I think uh, I'm starting to pay close attention uh, what I'm sort of terming is a European reawakening. We talk about the Arab awakening. A European reawakening uh, in its foreign policy efforts uh, towards North Africa in the Middle East. The stakes are very high for Europe, obviously, uh, both uh, economically as well as politically. And I think you're seeing now uh, a much stronger uh, uh, role for Europe. Perhaps this is because the United States, whether uh, uh, the leadership from behind model or uh, perhaps in, in the Israeli-Palestinian context, it, having a difficult time expressing and influencing, perhaps Europe now sees an opportunity and a moment uh, to use its unique blend of soft power, and I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, in providing really impressive amount of funding to the Palestinian Authority, as well as their, their leadership diplomatically to see where they can bring some, some resolution uh, to this. So uh, indeed, let me talk about uh, a bit on, on the Palestinian front. Uh, like Libya, unfortunately, there's nothing common about the European uh, foreign and security policy towards the Middle East. Uh, it's fractured, uh, and I think we will definitely see that uh, uh, playing out next week. Um, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu has spent a great deal of time this summer in European capitals, I think in anticipation uh, of uh, trying to shore up European uh, European uh, support uh, in some part or, or negate uh, uh, European activism against Israeli positions. Uh, what we're seeing though will be a split. Uh, the German government has already messaged pretty clearly that it will not support uh, efforts uh, by uh, the, the Palestinians to, to seek uh, membership or, or a status. I think in part this is in response to their Libya vote uh, where they are messaging early and often uh, to, uh, to sort of uh, manage the surprise factor of their abstention on uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1973. I think you're going to also see uh, a split, quite frankly, uh, with France uh, leaning certainly towards support the Palestinian position, and I think we have to watch very closely the, the, where the British come out on this. Um, obviously, Tony Blair is uh, taking a leadership role as uh, the special envoy for the quartet, but again, they do have a problem. Uh, they want to be seen uh, as, a, as an honest broker here, and I think, as, as John was saying, no one's going to win here, and they're very concerned about how this is going to reflect uh, on them. So I think we'll, we will watch them. The other actor to watch, quite frankly, is uh, Catherine Ashton, uh, the EU uh, high representative. Uh, again, this is in part her credibility test. Uh, she was in the region earlier on Monday. I think she's trying to uh, develop uh, some sort of a package that would uh, incorporate, at least again, this is what we're, we're seeing from early reports. I think this is going to be a moving story throughout uh, to try to manage a package where the quartet has a statement, sort of going back to, to, uh, back to the, the negotiations, but perhaps putting some carrots in there that would uh, be uh, conducive. So We'll see if uh, the EU can play a role here. I have my doubts because the member states will, quite frankly, be quite, uh, quite divided. It's interesting to note, again, how much the EU has uh, put forward financially in strengthening Palestinian uh, institutions. And I think, again, this is European soft power. Uh, our sort of back of the envelope uh, calculation since 1994, the EU has provided uh, uh, nearly 4 billion uh, euros uh, in assistance uh, since 2008. That figure has been one point six billion euros and uh, just uh, early this week uh, the EU gave a 16.3 million euro infusion to pay for Palestinian salaries so they have an enormous amount of investment uh, in seeing uh, the, the Palestinian uh, institutions strengthened. I think uh, so we, we'll see this move forward. Uh, as a side note I think the interesting uh, issue to watch is obviously Turkey's role uh, in this and uh, this is sort of one of these you put a asterisk beside this and we'll, we'll continue to watch this space and we actually at CSIF ha CSIS have been following quite closely uh, Turkey's uh, reorientation uh, potentially away from Europe uh, and uh, what that I impact has on uh, potential uh, EU accession conversations with Turkey. Uh, this is potentially a thorn in the side of Turkey, uh, of, the, of the European leadership in this part of the world if they're uh, 
feeling a bit of competitive space with Prime Minister Erdogan. So uh, we'll continue to watch that. And finally, as Mark has mentioned, meanwhile, uh, as we're watching uh, New York very closely, we're continuing to follow very closely the European economic crisis. And that will be the conversation in the hallways. That's why Secretary Tim Geithner has decided he needed to visit Europe twice this week and is in Poland today. Um, we, uh, we are watching these developments because, again, to get back to John's quote, the very best of times we have some external foreign policy activism by Europe. The worst of times is because I, I believe that we are watching what has been over an 18-month crisis starting to morph into a slow motion collapse. Um, and this will be, this is the story uh, for Europe. This is the, the story for the global economy. And uh, watching that uh, in relationship to how events unfold in, in New York, I think will be very, very interesting. And, and I'm certainly, I don't want to derail from our focus here, which is on UNGA and, uh, and the conversations in New York, but I uh, would uh, not suggest to you that this is not going to be the hallway chatter uh, in the halls of New York. So with that, thank you very much. Turn it over to you, Andrew. Colleagues, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. If you could uh, speak into the microphone, that would be helpful for the transcript and identify uh, who you are and what news service you're with. Uh, we'll start with Howard. Great, thank you. Um, I guess whoever, maybe John or Mark, but um, do you see any usefulness to, I mean, we are hearing these uh, rumors of, of some kind of a, uh, some kind of a plan, either coming from Blair or Ashton, um, but um, that would kind of include elements where the Palestinians would be able to take something to somebody, maybe, maybe the Security Council, but shunt it off quickly to Bonn. Or, but anyway, um, with the idea of, of allowing some uh, time for, um, for uh, negotiations, direct negotiations to get going again, do you see any usefulness to that? And secondly, uh, I mean, are there any any prospects for talks getting going, and even if it is three months? Um, and secondly, on, on Libya, um, I'm just wondering with this resolution um, today, uh, but yet with uh, what impact might that have on the fact that there's still these pockets of uh, resistance? Um, uh, is it designed at all to kind of influence the the new government in its approach to? you know, maybe not, not attacking these pockets or, or not violently going after Gaddafi? Um, you know, in my analysis, the principal problem is, is a political problem and not a diplomatic one between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, and the goal has to be to change the politics in each community, partly um, to create a sense of urgency to negotiate and partly to create a sense of necessity to negotiate. I don't see these resolutions doing either one of those. Everything I've heard about the resolutions will raise Palestinian expectations for where they are make Israel feel more embattled, make Israel feel uh, that it's being delegitimized on the world stage. And rather than creating an urgency to negotiate, I see Israelis interpreting that as a sign they have to dig in. Um, I haven't, I've, I've heard rumors of the proposals, I haven't seen the proposals. I think you have to design the proposals to affect the political realities in those two communities. Uh, not find some structure to get negotiators in a room. Because even if the negotiators in a room can reach an agreement, they can't get people outside the room to buy into that agreement under current circumstances, in my judgment. Um, I don't know, I haven't heard anything about the, the resolutions intended to deal with these three pockets of resistance in Libya. <clears throat> um, I think that is principally a military issue uh, rather than a diplomatic one at this point. What we have seen an awful lot of 
is the international community trying to assist the Transitional National Council figuring out the tasks it needs to do and structuring, framing them, um, and trying to help them accomplish them to the extent they can give technical assistance. There has been a remarkable openness to that kind of assistance, I think in part because it hasn't been tremendously heavy-handed. You haven't seen 4,000 aid workers going in saying, okay, now we're going to run your country for you. Uh, Ian Martin's team, I think, is going to be on the order of 60, uh, which is calculated in part to help the Libyans but not overwhelm them. Um, the question, though, remains, and it's a question the answer to which will only become clear over the next several months, whether the people we're working with are going to be the people who end up in power in Libya. And that is an unanswerable question at this point. The people we are working with now are making a lot of the right noises. They seem to have a lot of the right instincts. Um, whether in a year's time we're going to look back and say we were all naive, whether in a year's time we're going to say we empowered the right guys and this went in a useful direction, whether it's going to be something mixed, we, it's too early to tell. But I can tell you that, that one of the things on the mind of the people in the Obama administration is very much trying to learn the lessons of the last 15 years of conflict, of trying to draw the experiences of learning lessons from Iraq, learning lessons from, from Timor, learning lessons from a whole range of places um, about what the role should be, right-sizing the role, not so you maximize um, what we'd like, but so you maximize getting what we need. Um, yeah, very, I, I, I agree with, with, with everything John said. I just say on the Palestinian side, um, it would be, and I have a, a little, not, not nearly the, the, the background that John has, but a little bit of background in this, and I just, I think it would be very hard for Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas to pull back this um, uh, multi-month-long um, move toward the United Nations, very public move toward the United Nations, uh, w without a, a very, very concrete um, uh, process uh, laid out in front of him. Uh, he, he has his own political issues to deal with as well, in, in, in including a Gaza that's controlled by Hamas. And um, uh, so w whatever the Europeans are trying to put on the, uh, on, on the table, and, and I would imagine that Heather might talk a little bit more about that, uh, it would need to be extremely concrete and, uh, um, and, and, and pointing toward progress soon. And I think that's very unlikely, as John said. Um, on, on Libya, it, it, exactly right. I, I, I haven't seen the draft resolution, but I don't think that it, it – um, uh, it, it, it addresses the, the, the pockets of resistance. It, it's, a, it's really it's, it's a, it's a longer-term um, uh, mandate for um, a mission that will provide assistance to Libya as, as, it, as it moves forward um, with a focus on democracy, on human rights, um, on transitional justice, as well as on effective governance. Um, and so to the extent that some of those human rights and, and, uh, uh, and transitional justice questions would come up in the, in the treatment of, uh, of Gaddafi's supporters, uh, the UN would be very strongly urging um, uh, th this regime to uh, uh, not, not to act in the way that the previous regime did and to, uh, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to keep human rights uh, um, uh, obligations uh, in the forefront, as, as well as it, to, to think about transitional justice questions. You know, will, be, will, will people be tried? Uh, what, what types of people will be tried and, and in, in what circumstances? Um, but I, I think the one thing we need to, to, to recognize, and I think John alluded to this, is transitions take a very long time and often have uh, a, a, a follow a very bumpy path. Uh, um, re recent work done by the, the World Bank has shown that, that transitions from um, uh, authoritarian rule to democracy can take uh, up to a decade or more, and in some cases a generation to to be solidified. So, so exactly the people we're talking to now, will they be the people who who who, um, who will be in power six months from now, and 
will they be the people that, that are in power um, uh, three years from now and 10 years from now, we, will we look back and say, you know, it was dicey for a while, but Libya has, 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 uh, has, has moved toward democracy. And I, I think we can look at, at Indonesia and other places and see their, their paths. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Margaret Tollive with Bloomberg. So um, I've got like a million questions, but I'll try to stick to the main ones. Um, what are the stakes for those of us who cover President Obama, for President Obama at the, at the UN General Assembly this year? His speech last year was all about saying, hey, I think we can come back here next year and celebrate you know, a peace deal. And obviously, that's not what this is all about. Um, but what is, he, what is he trying to show the world? Do Americans care? What are the domestic political stakes for him? Is there a stake among Jewish voters in America? And then on the ICC question, are there any real criminal or whatever liability implications for, uh, for the Israelis? Or is that just sort of theoretical if there is uh, a general assembly, a broad general assembly um, vote? Thanks. Um, I'm going to do a partial duck on the first question, a complete duck, and defer to counsel on the second question. Um, the way I read the newspaper, everybody's talking about everything but the general, the president's speech to the general assembly meeting. Um, I, the president is clearly focused on jobs and the economy. The politics of the budget are, are huge. Uh, we have a, a extraordinarily active Republican primary. I don't see the American public hanging on the words of the president at the General Assembly. That's not to say the president doesn't have a set of important tasks at the General Assembly. I think he has been trying <coughs> to position America where he wants the country to be in international affairs. Um, he has been trying to lead but not dominate. He has tried to accommodate others' leadership. He has tried to uh, articulate principles that guide the way we see the world. Um, the, this was initially welcomed with rapture and has been dismissed, and I think he needs to, to re-articulate it uh, in a way that's persuasive to an international audience. But I just don't see a huge domestic audience um, for him at the General Assembly. And my guess is that <clears throat> the message of the month has to do with uh, the economy and international affairs. Uh, no, I, I think I think that's right. I I, th I think the stakes are are extremely low now. Um, and and what, what one way they're they're low is that there won't be a vote on the Palestinian issue next week. So it's not as if President Obama will be there and 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 have to, you know, sit in the Security Council and exercise the U.S.'s veto. So it, there will be a number of speeches. There'll be a number of meetings. There are much more important, almost tectonic issues going on uh, in the world economy. Um, so I, I really don't think the stakes are all that high, and the Palestinian issue will, will play out more slowly. Um, th this is a chance for President Obama to highlight, um, uh, you know, the positive occurrences as, as, as regards Libya, and maybe push a little bit on, on Syria and a few other issues. And uh, um, and I would say that's about it. On the ICC, it's purely theoretical for Israel. I mean, you know, the the a first step would be. The Palestinians being able to being able to accede to the Rome Statute and and, and become a, a member state of the of the ICC, um, they would then have to refer the matter to the office of the prosecutor a, a matter to the office of the prosecutor and it's theoretical as to what they would do. The office of the prosecutor would have to decide to to take it up and then determine that there's a prima facie case and then it would bump up against Israel's non-membership in the International Criminal Court. So no, th this is not something that would um, uh, that would be an immediate threat to Israel, or even a medium, or even a longer term threat. Ron Campius from Jewish Telegraphic Agency. Uh, given the um, given the amounts that Europe is 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 uh, has dedicated to the uh, Palestinian Authority, how significant? I mean. It, 
the, the two congresswomen who are actually important on uh, Palestinian funding have said they're going to cut it off. So it looks like they're going to cut off Palestinian funding. So how, how important would that be? And then, uh, and for Mark Quarterman, the, the, the way that the Republicans, that the conservatives have tried to cast the Obama administration in the United Nations is that in terms of what they actually do, they do the right thing. They veto, they oppose, but in terms of what they say, they represent a new tone in terms of criticism in Israel, of Israel, and they point to Susan Rice's speech at the Security Council when they vetoed the uh, settlement resol resolution in, in the spring. Is that, is that correct? Has there been a change in tone? I, as the events unfold and as Congress makes some funding decisions, uh, European assistance to the Palestinian Authority will, will only grow in importance. I would argue that it's been uh, absolutely uh, vital in contributing to the institutional capacity that we have seen today, and certainly with U.S. support. I don't mean to uh, uh, not suggest that uh, American financial support and uh, technical assistance hasn't been vital, but the EU has put forth an extraordinary amount, and I think they're going to be very loath to uh, see that investment not uh, continue. Uh, what we don't know in the long term, and this is something we're, we're studying longer term trends, how austerity begins to impact uh, Europe's ability to continue to support this type of effort. What we've seen so far through both the, the UK's uh, recent budget cutting exercise, they are willing to reduce European defense spending, but they keep their official development assistance fairly strong, which again is, a, I think, an underlying testament to their, their view that soft power uh, is, a, is a vital instrument uh, for them. So it will, it, it will continue to be very vital, and the decisions that the EU makes, as well as individual member states, about how they're going to fund uh, this uh, in, in over the coming uh, months, uh, I think will, will be important uh, in, in providing some tangible support, and I will turn the rest over to you, Mark. And I'd also like to hear from John on this, since they do have this, 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 this book on U.S.-Israel relations, but I'll, 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 I'll and, and the question you're asking about the tone, of course, is a much bigger question than just U.S. performance in the United Nations. But as regards the, the, the United Nations, um, there might be something of a change in tone from the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, of course, the George W., which was, in effect, a high watermark of U.S. support for, for Israel, uh, um, uh, uh, in, uh, at least in rhetorical terms. Um, I, I would say that um, in, in, in broad policy terms within the United Nations, there has been very little change between the Bush administration the Obama administration and generally across administrations in, in voting against uh, um, resolutions on the issue in, uh, um, in um, uh, trying to keep um, the issue out of, uh, off the agenda of the Security Council among, among other issues. And so, but w we should also remember that the Obama administration launched a bit of a, um, um, uh, uh, an effort on the settlements issue, I think, in part to jumpstart the the, the peace talks, and so Susan Rice's comments could be seen in that context as well. But in, in a broader sense, I, I, I turn to John on this. Look, I, I think the Obama administration, when the chips are down, the Obama administration has stood firmly behind Israel. We saw it in the re response to the Mevri Marmara incident, where the president intervened actively <coughs> to keep this from turning into a Security Council witch hunt. We saw it just last week when Egyptian troops had held back when the protesters stormed the Israeli embassy and Prime Minister Netanyahu couldn't get the Egyptians on the phone, who made the phone calls? The Americans made the phone calls. And six Israelis were saved, perhaps within moments uh, of, of when the security would have been breached. Um, I think the President is, is quite frankly perplexed that because I've spoken to, to people who work closely with him in Israel, and, and, and his sense is that he's not anti-Israeli. Whenever he says anything, he's perceived to be anti-Israeli, although his actions are protect Israel's interests but urge Israel to move forward toward a negotiated settlement that can resolve this conflict in the, in the longer term. Um, but it seems to me that, that what, what we have is a combination of language that seeks to move Israeli actions and actions that consistently protect Israeli interests. And 
what I think is perplexing to the administration is the sense that rather than, than the actions speaking loudly and, and reassuring Israelis that these are done in order to protect Israeli interests, they take the words and they say, see, he doesn't have our interests at heart at all. Yeah, if, 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 I could, if I could just follow up on that. Um, it, specifically on, on this question that we spent most of our time talking about, uh, uh, either upgrading Palestinian or upgrading Palestinian status what, 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 of the two options. The U.S. once again is putting itself in a position of isolation in the United Nations based on, on a principle. And the, the principle is that, that peace, uh, um, uh, the peace process should go through uh, negotiations between the two parties and not through New York. Um, uh, the, the U.S. has consistently done this in its support of Israel and has consistently isolated itself, and I really don't see a difference in this administration's actions versus the actions of previous administrations. Uh, thanks. Uh, George Condon with National Journal. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, to Heather, could you elaborate on the, what you, you said, the, uh, the hallway chatter on the uh, debt crisis? What, what are the Europeans looking for from the president? What is he looking for? And, and secondly, to follow on, on Margaret's question, I, I guess a little pushback. Presidents go there every year. Uh, most of the speeches are eminently forgettable, and as John suggested, most of the action has been in the, uh, in the bilats. Well, <laughs> you, you channel them. Uh, so, uh, but the, uh, isn't the moment uh, such that with all the issues that you talked about, that People are, the stakes are raised for the president. Isn't the international community looking for some kind of leadership, something in this speech? Uh, thank you. Very, very briefly, I mean, I, I think um, there is precious little that the administration can do uh, regarding the, the European sovereign debt crisis. I, my critique, I think the administration was a bit slow to realize over the last 18 months, the gravity of the situation. But I think really beginning with uh, Chancellor Merkel's uh, state visit here in June, where the president dedicated a lot of that conversation uh, to the economic crisis, I think it was slowly beginning uh, to, to wake up the administration that this uh, is, is a great and grave danger to the American economy. Um, what Secretary Geithner's visit uh, to Poland today does a couple of things. It raises the stakes enormously for what the U.S. can do, but again, the gap is we can't other than to urge Europe to take action. Now, the problem is, politically, they are unable to take the steps necessary. Um, and uh, this month is going to be a, a really interesting month to watch as the 17 Eurozone members have to vote on the July 21st summit uh, decisions where there seems to be absolutely lack of agreement whether they can do that or not. Uh, to suggest that the world's, uh, the weight of the world, economic uh, weight of the world is on Angela Merkel's shoulders is not an understatement. Um, but uh, politically, you know, the stars could not be more misaligned. Are you uh, suggesting the president should give her a back rub? <laughs> <laughs> Big no comment. Um, <laughs> John, you're naughty. Um, but uh, th this is truly where, and this is, uh, again, with all respect to the amazing events that are going on in the Middle East, this one element uh, will absorb us. And there's very little the United States can do about it other than to hope that the Europeans, as I think what Geithner will come out and say, get your act together. You had uh, Christine Lagarde yesterday again, the dire consequences. The rhetoric is, you know, emergency, emergency. The political action uh, cannot get there. So uh, as I just say, I don't want to divert our conversation. Uh, please, please watch this space because it is going to transform uh, Europe and the transatlantic relationship substantially. If I give it a baseball analogy, uh, if the European sovereign debt crisis is a nine-inning game, we're only in about the second or third inning. Uh, this is going to be uh, an extraordinary story. So stay tuned. For the next president, we turn to back rubs. <laughs> <laughs>
Transparency here at CSI. Yeah. Mark. Um, and on, on the issue of speeches, the, the, there, is, there, there is a global crisis of, of, uh, of, of uh, um, a, a multifarious global crisis now, but this is not necessarily a time uh, where the world is looking for a presidential speech at the General Assembly to reshape things. I mean, I, I, I worked for the UN for 12 years, and, and for most of those years, uh, got a chance to sit on the floor of the General Assembly during, during speeches, and there are two that, that, that stick out for me uh, out of that entire time. One was Bill Clinton's last speech, where he received a standing ovation. I don't remember a word he said, but he received a standing ovation in the General Assembly, which is unheard of for uh, a, a head of state or government. I mean, and, and this is after um, uh, 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 impeachment and a range of issues, his last speech, it was extraordinary and the warmth in the room. Um, and President Bush's speech in which he virtually declared war against uh, Iraq and, 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 and threatened the UN with irrelevance. I was on the floor to hear that too. Otherwise, this is not the time to roll out a new initiative, even if a new initiative is needed. And, um, uh, and this is probably not the time for a new initiative because these crises, whether it's it's the Arab Spring or the European debt crisis or what I consider to be a general kind of slow tectonic shift in power within multilateral institutions is playing out. These are playing out more slowly. So I, the, the speech is not, is not the crucial issue here. Question, question maybe for Mark is, sorry, for Mark is, do the Palestinians need to go, can they go, to, if they chose to, could they go directly to the General Assembly or do they need to go through the Security Council first? Um, so, and is there a sense that maybe the U.S. is pushing them towards the General Assembly first? And then the two broader questions are, first, if you could maybe, John, give an assessment of where you think the U.S. standing is in the Middle East these, these days, you know, sort of two years after the Cairo speech, you know, after the whole Arab Spring, and to what Im impact do you think a veto would have on that, if, if any significant impact on sort of his broader effort to sh reshape the um, view of the United States? And then finally, it seems from where I sit as a White House reporter that the, President Obama has sort of stuck his neck out for the Palestinians in being tough, at least rhetorically, on Israel in a way that was politically risky for him at home. And is there any sense that, and right now they're trying desperately to get the Palestinians not to do this, you know, is there any sense that the Palestinians are being a little sort of, um, you know, slap in the face of the U.S. after whatever it is that Obama has tried, or maybe from their point of view he has not done all that much anyway? Maybe a, a quick answer to the, to the technical question. Um, the, the Palestinians could choose either to go the General Assembly route or the Security Council route. The Security Council route is full membership in the United Nations. The General Assembly route is um, uh, increasing their status to non-member state. Um, uh, I, I was a bit surprised to hear that they decided to go the Security Council route and therefore force a U.S. veto. Um, and I, I would say that the U.S. is not trying to push the Palestinians to the GA, but in effect trying to push the issue out of the U.N. Uh, they would rather that neither of these uh, uh, questions come up. Um, U.S. standing in the Middle East has declined in the last two years for a number of reasons. Um, one is there's a sense that, that the U.S., hasn't been effectively doing what it set out to do. Uh, there's a perception it hasn't been effective with Iran, that it hasn't been effective with Iraq, that it hasn't been effective moving toward Arab-Israeli peace. And so the th and there's disappointment both in governments that the U.S. has not stood by its allies in the Arab Spring and among publics that the U.S. has not played as active a role as it should have promoting um, political reform. Added to this, certainly on a leadership level, is a perception that our budget situation means that looking forward, we're going to be a less consequential power than we've been. So I think if you look at everything, there is a perception that we are a waning influence on events, that we are not the positive influence that people had hoped 
we would be. That's not to say we've become inconsequential. It's not to say people have written us off. But I think you're seeing a number of countries thinking about supplementing their relationship with the United States. You've seen Turkey playing a more prominent role. And I just had a, a piece in our newsletter last week um, about Turkey's efforts to build ties with Saudi Arabia, uh, which I think is partly about a changing role for the United States and, and the sense of countries in the Middle East they have to, to build their alliances differently. Um, as I say, it doesn't mean we're inconsequential. And I think this is a slide that began some time ago. Uh, but it's a slide that the president had hoped to arrest and has not been able to arrest. In terms of um, sort of Palestinian gratitude, I think what the, the president's actions have gotten him anger on all sides and gratitude on none. Right. I mean, the Israelis feel the president dislikes them. Um, The Palestinians feel the president has gotten rolled by Prime Minister Netanyahu and has not been able to protect their interests. And there's a complaint that the United States still ends up being the Israelis' lawyer instead of a mediator. Um, that the president says he's going to do things and those things don't happen. And the, the sort of failure to make progress on settlements, which the president identified as a key goal, uh, ended up not having a huge effect on, on Israeli settlement activity. Um, I don't know uh, an easy way to get out of this problem. But you have a really serious set of political challenges in the Palestinian community which this president inherited, which aren't getting any easier to deal with. And again, I think that, that there, because we cover diplomacy, there's a huge interest in covering the diplomacy. And because negotiations have often involved us, when we think of tools available to the United States, people rush to negotiations. That's something we can do. We, can, we know how to set up negotiations, and we know, how, you know, we know how to reserve the rooms at the hotels, and we know how to get the conference facilities, and I mean, all that stuff. We know how to do negotiations. When you say you have to affect Palestinian politics, you have to affect Israeli politics, you have to reassure the Israeli people. That's harder. And I think the instinct is, we're going to have negotiations because we know how to do it. I think what we have to be much more creative on is how can we create the politics because, and I've said this I think before in one of your briefings, I can't remember any time in history when two sides have made peace, when at least one of those parties didn't believe there was both an urgency and a necessity to make that peace. And I look at these two antagonists and I don't see either side feeling there is either an urgency or a necessity to make a deal. And under those circumstances, you can have all the negotiations in the world, but you can't get a peace deal. I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I, because I have to make a phone call before I roll out this wonderful study by Chaim Malka next door in 20 minutes. I'm gonna have to run, but I would love to, to talk to all of you again soon. And thank you, Andrew, for this. Sure. Thanks, John. Thanks. Can, can I just really quickly, you, uh, just just a word on what John just said too, especially the last part of it. Um, it you know, I, after 12 years at the UN, I'm, I'm a relative newcomer to Washington, and I'm struck at the extent to which the thinking here is: well, what can we do, and why can't we make these people change their views, or why, you know, why isn't the president making peace in the Middle East, or why isn't he affecting this? And I, I, th I think I think that there, we, we need to have a greater sense of the limits of external actors in conflict resolution as well. Um, external actors can be extremely useful 
when, as John said, one of the par at least one of the parties, and it, it's often the need for the most powerful one to think this, feel, or it could be either, feels it an urgent need. But, um, but Washington can't move things if, if, the, if the situation isn't ripe and the time isn't ripe. Uh, Martin Klings from the German Weekly Die Zeit. Uh, two questions. One uh, concerning the, the Palestinian-Israeli issue in the United Nations. When, when are we going to see the showdown? Is it going to be Friday in the next weekend or uh, uh, like in, in, in the case of the timetable? And then uh, to you, Heather, about uh, the European crisis. Um, you know, uh, Geithner being in, in Europe and telling get your act together is probably as complicated as Europeans telling Congress get the act together. <laughs> But uh, what you, what you uh, might see uh, in the upcoming days or weeks could also be uh, you know, in, an increase of the crisis because of a collapse of the German government. Um, the German government is deeply divided uh, over the, uh, the bailout issue. And uh, you follow that intensely. Uh, intensively. So uh, I don't know how they get out of this quagmire, you know, because it's, uh, the, as you know, they have this coalition and the two parties have totally different standpoints. And even inside the, the Christian Democratic Party is a huge division. Um, on, on, the, on the first issue, uh, in, which is a much easier question, um, I, I think the plan is for President Abbas, uh, after his speech, and I think he's speaking on the 23rd, to present his request to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Um, uh, who, who knows then when it will happen? You know, there won't be a showdown next week. There will be a request next week. And, and then it, it has to get on the Security Council agenda, and, and the resolution needs to be drafted. And, and so it will take some time. Um, Is it going to be in this session? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, it, the, the Security Council meets on a rolling basis, so there isn't, there isn't a session question in the way there is with the with the General Assembly. The General Assembly, because there's such overwhelming support for it, could move fairly quickly. Uh, so if, if it takes a month or so for it, for it to make its way through the Security Council to a U.S. veto, um, and, and this has happened before on other issues, you can imagine within weeks the General Assembly could have a resolution uh, ready to go. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so, and so that, that, that could happen soon after that. But no, there won't be a dramatic showdown during the general debate while the heads of state and government are there. Uh, and very briefly, I'm going to be very uh, respectful of every, everyone's time, and Martin, you and I can uh, follow up on, on this later. You know, in some ways, the, the strains of this conversation of what John talked about, uh, we know how to negotiate, we know how to talk and hold conferences and keep talking, but how do we affect the political process, uh, whether that's in, in the Middle East, whether that's in Europe, whether that's here in our own country, uh, we, this is exactly where we find our complexities. Uh, if there was a logical way forward, we would have found it. It's, it's the, the political processes that have just stymied this, and, and very true in, in German uh, domestic politics, um, where there is a, a deep division about what to do and the responsibility of the German taxpayer uh, for what they see as proliferate uh, spending by the periphery. Uh, but this is also across Europe, and it's not just uh, north-south, uh, the northern states versus the, the periphery. It is young and old. We are going to see uh, it's, it's uh, European versus sort of a, you know, immigrant, anti-immigrant. We are going to see these tensions play out across Europe, which is, is just accelerated by the economic crisis. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you later about uh, my views on the on the, the German government. But again, the the what uh, the chancellor's how, what decisions she takes, uh, whether uh, how this will un unroll, uh, it will have an enormous impact uh, on the coalition government and and in German politics, quite frankly, for the next decade. So this will uh, the stakes are extremely high. Um, uh, th that would be a very dramatic move, especially from the podium of the General Assembly. I, I, I don't have any sense of, uh, of that. And, and I, as, I, as I recall, there, there was some pushback from the Iranian judiciary that might slow that process down, too. So it's not, an, it's not entirely clear that something like that would happen.
uh, Amr Madhani USA Today, the, the Saudi aspect of this, where, you know, they basically really laid it out in real clear terms of what the consequences would be of a U.S. veto. Your sense of how serious that is and how grave of how, how grave the consequences would be um, to for a fraying of that relationship for the U.S. Um, not an expert on Middle East politics, uh, Middle East diplomacy, but um, uh, I, I can say just just from observation that the that relationship is frayed in other ways. I mean, this would be a continued fraying in some ways of, 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 the, of the relationship. And I, I, th I think that John um, uh, struck a very in interesting note when he talked about the, the, the Turkish effort to increase relations with Saudi Arabia. I, I, th I think Saudi Arabia has serious concerns about a, about a, uh, um, a perception of abandoning uh, um, uh, the, the Mubarak and um, and and uh, Arab allies um, uh, uh, was concerned about even U.S. statements about Bahrain, and we saw that the Saudis sent troops there. Um, is geopolitically concerned about the rise of Iran in the region, especially with the fall of Saddam Hussein's regime, and um, and so so if if anything, but the Saudis. Um, the Saudis it, it, it are, are surprisingly and, and interested in Middle East peace and feel that um, uh, at uh, an Arab League, League summit some years ago, they, they, they put out a, um, a, a reasonable process that has been rebuffed um, uh, and, and bring it up uh, on a regular basis. Um, uh, so, no, th this would be serious for the Saudis, but the Saudis also have geostrategic reasons to remain in a close relationship with the United States, and I'm sure they will balance that. Sure. Just a really quick point. I, I was thinking about this as, as, as Heather was talking, and I always think about this in terms of the United Nations. And this is, is my, my, my sense of multilateral politics. And I, I, I actually don't use the word diplomacy much, because within multilateral institutions, it's so legislative, it's, 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 it's more, I think, better characterized as politics. And this might be esoteric, but you know, we've been doing bilateral relations between countries in the manner we're doing it since the beginning of the Westphalian state, you know, 1648 or so. We've been doing this form of multilateralism since the end of the Second World War, and we're seeing the growth pains of it. We're seeing it in the EU, which is an extraordinary success in so many different ways, um, but has, has serious structural problems. We see it in the United Nations as well. And so I, I just urge a longer-term view toward multilateral activity. I, th I think that we're, we're in, still in the early stages of learning how to do this. Successes in the UN, certainly failures. Um, but uh, it's something that we as states, and when I say we now, it's not just the United States, are only beginning to, to, uh, uh, to grapple with uh, dealing with effectively. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming today, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks.